And we are extremely privileged to have Hayden Williams, author of this <laughs> marvellous book, um, Chokery, who's going to, we've heard a lot about Levantines in the Ottoman Empire and the amazing impact there. What about Turks in Europe? Not just Turkish people, though there were Ottoman merchants in some seaports. There was the influence of coffee and cafes and hammams in leading cities, but above all of decoration, decor, pictures, clothes, every aspect of Tjokuri, and that is what Hayden is going to speak on tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Right. Uh, so what is Tjokuri? Well, I would take my cue from this quotation, uh, which is a description of what the Duchess of Ancaster wore at the, uh, the King Christian VII's ball held in London in 1768. And she was dressed as, Salta as a sultana, and as you see, the Gentleman's Magazine described the, the impact as having been transported in fancy to the palaces of Constantinople. And basically, I think Turkery is a transport of fantasy. And in a way, it's reiterated, reiterated visually by this backdrop, which is a wallpaper made by Dufour in Macon in France in around 1812. And it, the, the, this panorama is called On the Shores of the Bosphorus. And as you could know, it's as fanciful a view of the Bosphorus as you can imagine. But that is absolutely the essence of Turkery. Um, the fantasy wasn't immediate. Ever since the fall of Constantinople in 1453, there was an increasing fear of the Turk in Western Europe. It was coupled with a slight curiosity. And so from the mid 16th century onwards, you get costume books which show uh, Turkish dress. And this image on the left is taken from one of them. And it's unusual because most of the figures are single portraits, but here, um, just among the, the, the engraver has gathered a group together in, in, in what he imagined uh, what a, a meal would be like. You have two cavalry officers, a janissary, a courtesan, and a, sort of like a, guard, a guard. And it is, em, the emphasis is on the military, and it's basically because at this time the Turk was feared and seen as ferocious. Now, two centuries on you have what you see on the right by this time the Turk has been converted into somebody peaceful and amorous and it's uh, well depicted in this panel which is one of a series of four which was um, painted for a chateau near Chantilly all on Turkish themes right um, so from the outset, I think you, there are five things you should bear in mind about the subject. It cannot be identified as Islamic or Ottoman. It is a view of the Ottoman Turkish world taken at least one remove, often two or three times. It is more a reflection of the places where it was created than of the subject, ostensible subject. The responses were different in different countries and it should be seen as a theme rather than a style. Um, one of the most influential early books was this volume on the, uh, the left-hand side, uh, Nicholas de Nicolai, who actually did travel to uh, Constantinople uh, with a French ambassador. Uh, he was asked to do topographical drawings of Constantinople. He also made drawings of the inhabitants. And when he came back, he brought drawings uh, of these sitters, some of which were not done from life. He had, obviously, the female sitters he didn't have access to, so he borrowed clothes and draped courtesans with these clothes, so he, at least he could represent in some way. Anyway, some years later, because he, 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 his visit, he was in um, Constantinople um, in, uh, when were we, in, in, in 1551, 1552. It wasn't until uh, 1568 that the book was published in Lyon. And it was an incredible success right from the start. Very quickly you get 
uh, editions in English, Flemish, Italian, and German. And this sequence that you see here is an indication of the long-term impact of the Nikolai. It's of a Greek merchant, and you've got to remember, at this time, Greek merchants were a very prominent uh, part of, of um, Constantinople. So they, he wasn't just doing Turks, he was doing a portrait of the Levantine world. You, you get uh, other costume studies of females from the islands, uh, Greek islands and whatever. So here we have a Greek merchant. A few years later, a very important artist, Jacob Oligosi, uses the Nikolai for his composition. He, of course, he adapts it a little bit. This was of a large series of Ottoman subjects which were bound up. And by the mid-18th century, they found their way to the Gaddi Library in Florence, where the Doccia manufactory, uh, the Marchese Ginori, uh, had access to them. So it was, the album was lent to the uh, painters. So you get a pretty good transcription of the uh, Ligozi thing, uh, done in about 1745. Then the Galleria dei Lavori is a hard stone workshop, also in Florence, and they are also using the, um, the, the, the Dodger thing, but it, it, so it shows 200 years later that the, 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 the impact of the Nikolai continued. The next really influential book was this one. Uh, de Ferriol was a French ambassador in Constantinople at the very beginning of the 18th century. He commissioned a Flemish artist called Van Moor to paint portraits of the citizens of Constantinople. He took them back to Paris. They were engraved by a variety of engravers and published first in 1714. A very quick re-edition was done in it was still the date 1714, but actually down to 1715. And then in the mid-century, two further editions were done. And this became, in a way, the replacement uh, volume for De Nicolai uh, once, once it, it started circulating. Here we have an example of, uh, in fact, a, gr a Greek lady in, a, her in, in an interior. And it's interesting, to, uh, well, we, we can see the progression. This is uh, the, the De Ferriol plate. This Antonio Guardi, uh, this was, uh, he did a series of paintings for the von der Schulenberg in, in Venice. And you can see he has quoted the de Ferriol figure. And then the, the volume it is picked up by Ravenet, who does a copy of it, and then uh, after drawing by Boucher. So you know, it's, it's bouncing along. And then this comes, to, this, this engraving comes to England and it becomes a porcelain figure. One of the things I want you to notice is what's happening to her headdress. The Greek women in Constantinople wore an adapted form of Ottoman dress. They did not wear turbans. And one of the things which got me interested in this whole business of Turkey was why did Europeans insist that women wore, wore turbans? Because they didn't in the Ottoman world. And I think the origin of all this actually is here because you can see she's got her hair in a kind of loose mop uh, sort of, um, um, cap, which has been lightly bound with ribbons. Well, by the, what happens is when, an, when it's seen in black and white in the copies, the, the engraver thought, well, that's not, that, I don't, that's not a mop cap, that's a turban, so it becomes a turban. So by the time you get the Willems Chelsea figure, it really is looking a lot more like a turban. Now, that, that's one aspect of impact. The next thing are travelers and, and, and writers uh, bringing the message back from uh, Constantinople. And of course, Lady Mary Wortley Montague is one of the most famous and influential. Up top is a portrait of her by Van Moore, the man who painted the uh, studies for De Ferriol. And you can see her there with her son, Edward Wortley Montague Jr. And you notice she's dressed in uh, Turkish clothes. Now, she not only did this, but she also wrote about it. And down below, you see a copy of a uh, first edition of her, uh, the, her letters, which was published after her death. She died in 1762. They published a year later. But it's important to remember that she wrote these letters 
fully intending them for them to be circulated, and then fair copies were made. So well before she died, people, the people that mattered were very aware of what was um, going on and what she was writing about. And you get people, blue stocking ladies, commenting things, saying, oh, like in Lady Mary wanted, she was dressed rather like in Lady Mary wanted to use letters. So she has a big impact. And even people like Ang had a copy of Wortley Montague's letters. So it's, it's again, it's another instance of it being a source that carries on for a long time. The next kind of influence, which is in fact very, uh, not very Turkish at all, but in Western Europe it was absorbed as Turkish, was the translation by Antoine Gallon of A Thousand and One Nights. Um, he, it, the actual stories that he received were <coughs> actually quite vernacular and quite frankly crude. And he made them into contes agréables, he, more, more digestible for the court for whom uh, he, he was essentially uh, writing for. And first of the volumes was published in 1704, carried on for several years afterwards. And again, they immediately got absorbed into the, um, into the sort of kind of culture of, 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 of the, the, the people wanting to uh, pick up. Um, and this is a, a late engraving that, that it was actually an edition published between Geneva and Amsterdam, 1785, 89, which kind of is the visual equivalent of his writing because it's all very gallant and elegant and it's absolutely in keeping with the, uh, the spirit of Turkey. The fact that you know, most of the stories came from Iraq or Persia or India was absolutely of no relevance for the uh, people that were concerning themselves with Turkey. Now, the other people that had an impact, um, apart from people like Montague, who had gone to Constantinople with her husband, who was the ambassador, um, was, were, were, were other sorts of travels. That being said, Antoine de Favre, he was a um, French ambassador in the mid 17th, 18th century, and he, this is painted his portrait by, uh, uh, sorry, Vergen was the ambassador. De Favre was a, the, the, the artist who was quite heavily patronized by um, Vergen. He, he had 12 paintings uh, by the time he left uh, to, back for France, including his portrait, the portrait of his <coughs> wife that he married whilst he was there. Um, portraits of citizens and incredible panoramic views. So, you know, cross section of subjects. Um, so, that he, th these people help bring the Ottoman world to Western Europe, where most people had not really had much exposure. And that is also reiterated by the European merchant, which you see on the left. This is another plate from the Ferriol. And Quite amusingly, you can see he's wearing, um, he's, he's not entirely one nor the other. He's got his tricorn hat, he's got his wig, he's decided to grow a moustache, which is at a time, when you think at this time in Europe, facial hair was an absolute no-no. So he's making some sort of compromise. And then he's mixing, he, he, he's got, uh, he's wearing a um, caftan, Important thing, detail, notice it's hitched up. This is one of the things which is constantly picked up on by um, European artists. So it's, it's, it's a t actually a rather good example of the fusion of, 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 of East and West that these people brought back to Europe. And then thirdly, in the middle, we have this fantastic portrait by Lyotard of uh, William Ponsonby. It, he, this was painted whilst he was in Constantinople. When he came back, he and his friends uh, had a club called the Divan Club, which was a club of people that were either interested in the Ottoman world, had visited, or intending to visit. And so they were also helping to sort of widen awareness of the, um, of the Ottoman world, especially as quite a lot of them wrote books as well. Now, uh, the other way, of course, this world impacted on what the West was when Turks visited. Uh, they had visited rather insignificant, well, rather low level um, emission uh, envoys in the, in, the, in the earlier centuries. But in the beginning of the 18th century, they began to realize that the West was very, uh, you know, they could learn from the West and they were becoming more open to the need 
for them to, in a way to regenerate by observing what was going on in, in, in Western Europe. And so they decided they should send representatives of a higher caliber, social caliber, the, and, and, and the net result is you get the, very, the first man that had a huge impact was the man you see on the left. Now, he had started off as a janissary, but then he went in, into administration. And at the time he was appointed ambassador, he was in fact, um, uh, he was head of the, uh, of the imperial, uh, he was head of imperial accountant. So he was a, a um, an educate, he was, he was a, a kind, if you like, civil servant. He was also well educated. And de Bonac, who was the ambas French ambassador in Constantinople at the time, makes a point that he really tries to show his erudition by the way he speaks. And he gets to Paris, and you get Duchesse d'Orléans, who is quite an arbiter of what, what's what in Paris at the time. She says, I feel uh, ma uh, that manners have left the court of France for Turkey if one judges those of the Turkish ambassador here. You have to bear in mind that previous ambassadors had really ruffled the feathers, incl uh, of, incl including people like Louis XIV. So this change was quite significant. And not only was he diplomatic, he also mastered French gallantry. And there's this rather wonderful um, account that uh, uh, he was at a sort of a performance given in his honor in Paris. And he was sitting next to some sort of Mademoiselle de la Roche sur le Yon Conti. And she asked him uh, what he thought of the performance. And he replied, he was so taken by her charms that he had not attended those of the ballet. <laughs> and of course, you can imagine that went down extremely well. <laughs> well uh, so interestingly enough, he was received by uh, the very young Louis the Fourteenth, uh, sorry, Louis the Fifteenth, in, in in the Tuileries Palace, and uh, fairly a few, couple of years later, because the embassy was in 1721, this portrait was painted, commissioned by uh, Louis the Fifteenth, as a um, memorial of, of this very important embassy, and um, it's only recently appeared again, so that's a very exciting thing to see. Previously known was this magnificent portrait of Mehmed Said Effendi, who was the son of uh, Mehmed Effendi, and had traveled with his father to um, Paris in 1721. Again, he was extremely mondain. He learned French impeccably. I mean, even, even I mean, the, the French aristocracy said he speaks French without, with no accent. They were amazed. So, he, and then, in between going to Paris in 1742 and, um, and, and, and his, his first bit, travels abroad with his father in 1721, he was ambassador in, in, in uh, Sweden, in Stockholm, and in, in Warsaw. So he, he was, he was a career, basically a career diplomat. And here you see a port, and he, he had as much charm as his father. And uh, it's a little in, uh, in, in, instance of that is, um, there's this uh, a, a, a report that a Madame de F asked him why this lady asked him, do Turks have several wives? Because, the ambassador replied, they are lacking in your charm, and consequently, quality must be compensated with by quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyway, so, anyway, but this, this portrait of him is significant, uh, I think, in, because it's also, it, it, it represents the French view of him. It's painted by Aved. It was not a commissioned portrait. Aved was making use of his presence in Paris, because it was painted in 1742, the year he was in Paris. It was exhibited at the Salon, so, and he was the talk of the town, so if the artist wanted to get um, no, notice, what better than to paint a portrait of the man that you know everyone is talking about. And basically, even though he is dressed, he, he's dressed in the clothes that he wore for the presentation at, at Versailles, in, in the Salle de Glace, and that's quite, that was a really remarkable honor. And I think it sort of probably ties up with the fact that Louis XV was quite chuffed with the Turkish uh, embassy that, uh, of 21 years earlier, and so made, you know, pulled out the stops for the next one. 
Uh, but he's shown really like a uh, Western European uh, politician or whatever with the, the, the furniture. The attitude, okay, we've got Arabic script, uh, Turkish script on, on, on the documents. But he really is the projection is of a grand manner portrait in the, in the Western style. And then you probably can't quite see in the background here, you can see this is actually entourage returning back to Paris having been done, completed the embassy. His impact in Paris was great. Basically, everyone had the urge to go Turk. So on the left, you have uh, Madame de Broglie, who is wearing a costume which was borrowed by, from an actress called Madame de Granval, who, uh, which was accessed by uh, Gustav Tessin, who is the Swedish ambassador. And this portrait was actually painted for the ambassador's wife. She had already returned to Sweden. Tessin was acting as a go-between between Madame de Broglie and and uh, and that year. And, and so um, he borrows a theatrical costume. And this is quite important because you, we will come to see that theatre is a very strong influence on Turkey, and it's also a fantasy. Of course, you look at that dress. There is nothing to do with what an Ottoman woman would be wearing, but it suited the. Uh, European view. Ditto the painting on the uh, right, uh, another aristocrat who is dressed um, as a sultana. You've got even a mosque in the background. There, as the, it has been argued that this was also this costume was also borrowed from an actress, but I haven't been able to get the primary source confirmation of that. This one we do know because Tessin writes to his wife about I, I've been running around trying to find a costume for Madame de Broglie to wear. So this is by Abed, the same artist who painted uh, Mehmed, Efendi, Mehmed Said Efendi, pa exhibited in the Salon a year later. So he's carrying on the, the Ottoman uh, in the property on the general fervor of Ottoman things. Carrying on in a different way, this is Madame de Pompadour. Uh, originally this was a, a rectangular over door, but it's been cut down when it got, went to um, uh, Russia and had to fit in a different shape over door. So that we have that unfortunate shape now. Anyway, um, this this is again playing with the idea of the sultana as a woman of power and influence, and uh, and she is at propose. She's doing two things which very become sort of emblematic of the Ottoman. Uh, well, in Western eyes, she's having coffee and she's smoking. What's very interesting about this, though, is that it is highly likely that the artist, Carla Van Lu, was aware of this little drawing, which you can see at the bottom, um, uh, uh, which is one of an album of drawings which came to Paris at the time of the 1721 embassy of Mehmed Effendi. And you can see the figure, but the pose is very, very similar, and the fact that the, she's being offered coffee, of course, there are adaptations, but it is basically, I think, the root. And then above, you have a deferior plate. De Ferriol did use uh, Ottoman artists like, like Levni as a source for some of his pictures, which he could not otherwise imagine or whatever. So I think, again, there's this, the, the, the idea of the seated woman, which is not something very common in Western European art, but is much more part of uh, the Ottoman world, is, is, is derived from, from this. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now, the, it's, this is quite interesting because it's relatively early. I, I, I want to show. So if, if you trying to date when Turkey um, was to the fore, I, I think if you want, to say, it, a rabbi about 17, 1699 at the, at the Peace of Karlovitz, this is is a kind of mental changing point because the the, the no after the end of the Great Turkish War, the Turk wasn't quite so feared. And when fear passed, curiosity increased. So this is when you get a flood of um, uh, different, uh, a di different view of the Turk. And it carries on effectively to uh, really the, the French Revolution. And then it slightly peters out, even though you do get the odd flicker. So it's, a, it's about 90 years from the very beginning of the 18th century until the Revolution. Uh, this is quite amusing because it is a kind of commentary on the imagined world of the Sultan and the Harem. 
And here you have a master, I mean, he is um, wearing, and he has got a crescent on his head to show his, his potency. He's smoking a fantastic crystal uh, hookah. And you can see he's holding a handkerchief. Now this is a, something which really got, what Lady Mary Montagu got very peeved about because it was argued that it was the way the Sultan showed which uh, woman of the harem he wished to spend the night with. And he would drop a handkerchief in front of that person and then she was you know, prepared and went off. <laughs> and so the idea here that, that what Udri is playing on is this spaniel as, you know, is, is the winner this time. And, 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 and so, so it's, it's a quite a drop. But then it's rather wonderful, the eunuch is a black cat. <laughs> but, uh, so this, this, but this is also, it's, it's, I, think, I, don't, I, I, I don't think there's any sort of political undertones. I think it's just an amusing um, play on the ideas of the, um, that people ha had of the Ottoman world at that time. But it, it's been put in animal film. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier the power of the theatre, and really I think it is a, it is a driving force for, for all, throughout um, the, the, the subject. Um, the, in a way, you could argue the very first manifestation of Turkey is the, uh, the, the Turkish part of, uh, of the bourgeois gentilhomme, uh, which do you know the, 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 the basically the the the, 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 the uh, Monsieur Jordan, we use it, the man in the middle. Um, he is his daughter wants to marry a man. He doesn't want um, her to marry him, and so they contrive a plot to make him uh, agree. And the, the idea is that uh, her, uh, the, the friends um, pretend they are. Uh, re representatives of the, of the Sultan, and that they, uh, the, 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 they want the prince. The, the, they will basically give him a, fa a false title, of course, Mama Mushi, so that he, he can. Uh, they basically they can get there, and because he wants to have a title, so it's all very jolly. It, it started off interesting enough. It started off because Louis the Fourteenth had been unhappy about an Ottoman embassy the year before, and asked uh, Lully initially to make some sort of pe uh, peace about it. Lully, who'd worked with Moliere before, asked him to join in. So what was started off as basically a sort of ballet became a comedy ballet. Mm -hmm. And so the man on the right-hand side of that first group is in fact Lully, dressed as the Mufti. And then it is a whole, so whole um, uh, sort of play on the Turkish things. They were advised by a man called the Chevalier d'Arbeau, who actually had been to Constantinople. He had acted as a translator at the embassy the year before. But in fact, it was all exaggeration. And uh, Lully introduced some sort of percussion and, 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 and to, to make it sound a bit different from, uh, from the music people were used to hearing. And uh, Moliere had certain chants which made it sound exotic, but it, it was it was a complete folly. And it, but it was entertaining, and that, that, that it was it was funny rather than frightening is a very important shift. Um, and the next stage is what you see in the middle, which is um, the Théâtre de la Foi. The, the Salon Enfer in Paris was a very important place for small plays to be performed each year, and. Uh, Lesage and Dornaval were important playwrights of this genre. And the, the story of this is, is very simple, that Harlequin is given some sort of magical box that can elevate up and down as well or rather mysterious, and he helps um, one girl ma end up marrying the man that she wants to marry rather than the man that her father initially thinks is a good idea, but when he gathers that the man she wanted to marry is a prince of Persia, you know, it's all pretty good anyway. But I mean, it's, but it's all very jolly, and, but it's again, it's the, it's the light-hearted uh, take rather than the, the fear take. And then, uh, some decades later, you have um, Favar's uh, Suleiman II. Now, this again was very humorous, but it introduces another element, which is the sort of kind of waving the flag, the nationalist flag, because it's about three um, as women that aspire to the Sultan's heart. One is Spanish, one 
is Circassian, and the third is French. And you can imagine uh, who wins. And it's all, she's because she's actually rather quite slightly minx-like, but she wins through, through being cheeky. She wins the heart of the Sultan. But what's quite interesting about this is that um, Favar, in his memoirs, maintained that the costumes were authentic. Well, if you look at this engraving, it's hard. We, we're quite sure that Ravnall did not see the, the original costumes of the performance, because they're, they're all over the place. But he also made all sorts of costume um, stage set um, requirements, including details about spoons, which he clearly did know they were Ottoman sherbet spoons and whatever. And another thing he mentioned was ostrich egg chandelier. And that actually does hark back to the Suleimani in, in uh, Istanbul, where they, there are ostrich eggs suspended from the chandeliers. So he, he, he's, he is picking up some elements of co correct information, but then it's, the overall thing is merged into a comedy which is basically enhancing you know, the French, French pride. Another play, which was an uh, opera, which was hugely influential, was Rameau's, um, well, the, the whole thing is called Les Indes Galantes, but one of the most popular parts was the, the Turc Généraux. Now, this, the plot, is, the, uh, is, is basically about the benevolent, the, the, the apparently mean, hard Turk, who it ends up being extremely benevolent. And the the storyline is basically that um, he, uh, Os Osman the Turk has um, Emily a, as, as a captive. He falls in love with her. She says, no, no, I'm, I'm, I was engaged to Valère, and I'm not getting it up. And eventually, Valère or is shipwrecked on, on his lands. They brought, he's brought in. The, the lovers recognize each other. And then Osman realizes the game is up, and he, he gives them, uh, lets them go away together with, with presents. And it was this idea of the, the kind of ultimately benevolent Turk, which was a new chief, a, a, a new um, chief, and it actually is the same thing in Mozart's Flight from the Sarai. And but this is you know many is is is, is over forty years earlier. So it's 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 it's, it's a theme which is um, very popular and is played in in a, in a variation a variation of tones um, by different musicians. This performance actually took place in Vienna. And uh, so it's important to remember that the, it might have been composed in France, much played in France, and this one was particularly uh, very, very popular. It, it was performed across Europe. It was very popular. Um, and then carrying on this sort of costume thing, uh, uh, Louis René Bocquet was, was a <coughs> designed a lot, a lot of the state for the of the stage in, in France in the mid uh, 18th century, and his, for example, he he, he did Turc, Le Turc uh, uh, Généraux, and uh, this is one from another uh, opera, Skanderberg, which is in fact about an, an Albanian hero. But there's a huge um, Ottoman element, and it's set in Adrianople, and. Um, you, you can see the sort of costumes that were conceived to be Ottoman. And it's actually quite, I think, it almost looks like furnishing fabrics. And I think there's quite interesting about this, because slightly jumping on to this one, this is a, um, a detail of a cartoon for ca uh, a tapestry by Amade Van Lu, who was the um, nephew of, of Carl Van Lu, who painted Madame de Pompadour. And here you can see the costume is very, very similarly conceived between, and that, so I think that there's definitely some sort of dialogue between the, the, the stage and Van Lu's vision of Ottoman dress. And here it's just quite interesting. Here you just see how the canvas, oil on canvas, is transformed into a tapestry. And um, another detail, which is well, if, if you look at the edging of her kaftan, that is not the edge, normal sort of edging you get on clothes. It is, in fact, very much like the passementerie which you get on furniture. And, and, and there's this strange out of and, and, and interestingly, that, that there's a, a chair, has, uh, or rather a stool has recently been found, which is 
came from a Cabernet Turk, which really indicates that the, 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 the borders which you see there and what they were, how they were decorating chairs are, are, are um, very similar. So, so again, it's a case of, of not, um, not really being too true to type. I mean, you, can, you can use make it look like a furnishing fabric if you, if you feel like it. Now, the final aspect of this, this dress business is b a balls. And this is a detail of a ball which was held for the uh, marriage of the Dauphin in 1745. Uh, it was held in the Salle de Glace in Versailles three years after the Mehmed Said Effendi was received in their very same room. And here you see amongst the crowd two people in sort of kind of typical sort of masquerade sort of uh, Ottoman dress and then these extraordinary big headed figures. But I, I'm quite sure three years after the Ottoman, uh, major Ottoman emissary, which caused such a, that, 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 that people dressing this in the same room, there is a deliberate connection. And then on the right, we have um, this incredible the hall of masks uh, at Chesky Krumlov. It, it, it was a place of entertainment. It, you, you can see that all the people, there's this wonderful play of reality and, and illusion, because there are, sometimes there are mirrors here. So this, you as a spectator dressed up in costumes similar to the ones painted on the wall could become part of the um, wall. Here you have a man who is basically derived from a de Ferriol print. So it's, 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 it's the idea of the Turk does become part of the fancy dress, the ball and, and masquerade. I mean, it's what the, the Duchess of Ancaster was doing at the Duke of the um, King of Denmark's ball at the Haymarket. So, so, that, so, so it becomes integral to the, uh, well, a key, an important element of, of, um, of, 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 of entertainment. Another aspect was uh, sort of public display. And this was um, from a, a carnival celebration in Rome in 1748, where the students of the French Academy decided that they would do it like caravans to, to, to men. And on top, you have a, a view by Martin of, of the supposed government. He's in fact grossly exaggerated. There were not that number of people in the, um, in the cavalcade, but it didn't really matter. He was a, to create a general effect. He, in fact, was one of the participants in the performance. He was the black eunuch. And uh, Vien, the artist uh, further along, he wrote an account of what was happened in the preparations and how they decided to refer to current, tried to make it authentic, they were pretending, but they referred to things like that plate at the end, which from uh, by after Boucher in a, a recently published book by De Guerre. Uh, and so this the Boucher's image is in a way a kind of an elaboration of the de Ferriol. And, and then the students, because they, A, couldn't afford um, fine textiles, so what they did, they got basic crude linen and painted it with rich uh, um, co colors and patterns to make it look dramatic from afar. And so the end, he um, did a lot of drawings of the figures. He then, they were then engraved, and this is an, one of the engravings of it. The, fre the head of the, fre the, em the um, Academy in, in Rome, uh, de Troyes, thought the whole thing was such a success that he asked Jean Barbeau to create a record of the costumes. And so here is another of the costumes, the high priest. And you can see huge turbans. It's exaggeration, but that is key to the whole game. And um, this is quite interesting because this is an English book, a few published a few years later, where they have, he has seen the Vienne um, engraving, adopted it, and put it in a book of costumes suggesting uh, for, for, for costumes. Now, um, even before the unsuccessful uh, for the siege of Vienna in, in its eight, 1683, the Turks, the, the, the tents that the Turks used were an absolute obsession 
for, for Europeans. And when they captured the, 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 the abandoned, they took over the abandoned uh, camp of, of the Turks in 1680, they were absolutely amazed. You get these marvelous letters about the animals they found. It's so, it was like a, like a complete town. And so they, a lot of this went off as booty to the various people that were in the campaign. But if you didn't get enough, the people like um, Augustus the Strong sent people to Istanbul to buy tents to add to his collection. And then they were used for entertainments when his son got married to the Archduchess of Austria. Um, those tents were used as part of the celebrations. So by the, it's, a, it's a constant thing in the background of, 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 of it's an at attribute of the Ottoman world. So on top we have a, a design for a tent which was created, it was done in papier-mâché and, and painted canvas. Uh, in Paynes Hill Gardens in, in, in Surrey. And um, rather nicely, it has just recently been restored. It's now, it's now not very much, it's, it's uh, uh, fiberglass. But they have, with, because they had this uh, design, they were able to recreate it. And it's in, in a spectacular location in the park. It's for, for, you see it from afar, and then you have wonderful views from it. So it's, it, it was a, quite an early manifestation of the fashion, which um, carried on in, you get them in France, you get them in Sweden. The Presse was employed by Gustave III as a, a stage designer, and so I, and I think you can see that background in his design for the a tent in Haga Park. This tent also survives, it, it is made out of painted um, tin and, and, and with a wooden armature, uh, and, and there are other ones in. Um, Dropping on other in, in, in Sweden, so it, it, it's a kind of play. I mean, it, it, no one would, would mistake it for an Ottoman tent. But the point is, they were called Turkish tents to um, at the time. <coughs> Another thing which inevitably uh, intrigued the, 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 the West was the mosque. Now, um, here we have a mosque which was built in Kew Gardens. The, the pagoda you recognize, of course, is still there. This is, on the left, is the Alhambra, uh, which, another building which was there. It was a whole series of buildings representing all manner aspects of cultures across the world, including Chinese, Pavilions, and whatever. And just there, you have the mosque, which is what you can see over here. And this is Ch Chambers who um, was the architect of this work, used a, one of the first books on comparative architecture by a, an Austrian called Fischer von Erlach. And he extracted details from a number of mosques at Versa and other places, and, 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 and Budapest, um, where, and, and created this uh, building. Now, what's quite, you can't really see in this reproduction, but what looks like a flag Top is in fact a horse hair. It's a tug. It's not. It, it's not. It, it's 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 a it's a uh, it's an, the, the, the tug is an emblem of power of, of power in uh, the um, Ottoman world. For example, emperor in front of his tent would have six or seven of them stuck in front, and that was an indication that this was a really powerful man. So it's curious that um, Chambers decided to have that sort of thing dangling from the from the top. I just want you to notice that this here is, is, is solid because it, 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 there's a transformation you'll see in the later stage. This is an early design of um, chambers for the interior. And notice there are palm trees. This is another motif which comes through in, um, uh, in, in, in Turkey interiors. It was not executed like that. There's a sky painted on top. I think that probably comes from the um, uh, idea that when, when he when he saw the domes of some, in fact, um, of, 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 of baths, he saw stars cut in and said, oh, that star, sky, stars at night, but he did a daylight thing. This um, chambers uh, um, uh, uh, mosque for Q was it very quickly is converted into another mosque, this time a Steinfurt Banyo um, in, in Westphalia. 
Uh, but can you see here, instead of a solid, there are columns. So this again is wonderful mutations that you get when each time, it's a bit like a game of, Ch China, a game of Chinese whispers where the things get changed from, um, uh, from, from, from one version to the next. Uh, I have to say both these mosques have disappeared. What's interesting about the, this is we also see the interior. And Adam's, sorry, Chambers' interior was actually quite simply painted in mute colors. There wasn't too much decoration. Whereas this one is absolutely dressed up in um, full uh, French interior style. You've got sort of all the keynotes, you've got sofas, and rather curiously, it doesn't show well in this reproduction, the tie backs are in fact turbans. So, and then you get stars and crescents, all sort of emblems of the Ottoman world. And then another uh, sort of thing was the kiosk. And here, on, uh, the, those of you, the, the, this one still survives. The interior was designed by, uh, by Piper. Piper had seen the, um, the, the tent at, uh, at uh, Payne's Hill, and he did drawings of it, and he'd seen other things. And, and I believe he must have seen um, Chambers' drawings for the interior, which in the end were not executed, and which is why he's also decided to put palm trees inside his. In, in the end, it was done in a much more neoclassical style. But um, it's, it's another instance of um, Tur Tur Turkish elements being used as part of decoration of a, of a, of a park. This Haga park, this is the same place as the tent, which you saw a little bit earlier. Now we get to an interior which actually has survived. There were ones that had been done earlier, but they were mainly covered in textile, and those obviously haven't survived. In the, the, those, some instances, like the ones of the, for the Comte d'Artois, the, some of the furnishings have survived, but the rooms haven't. This one was done for Marie Antoinette at um, Fontainebleau, and the interior has survived. One or two teeny elements of the fittings, like the fire irons and the fire dogs, have survived, but the, the other furnishings have disappeared. But it's quite important as an indicator of well, you have, you have to look slightly hard to find Turkish elements. You get at the top, you can just see the, the hairs, the tub uh, element. You get crescents here, and you get the, the black and more, which of course there's a very much thing about the black attendants in, um, uh, in, in, in the harem. And then on the fireplace, you get actually really rather wonderful um, tur turbans in, 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 in Ormaru. Um, so, what they, you can see what, what's happened is they have taken a fairly classic um, French decorative uh, forms and just slightly embellished it with elements to make it slightly, they're dressing it up slightly in, in, in Turkish form. Another thing is, is that perfume burners, which of course you get in, in the Western Europe, but they, are, they become a kind of attribute to uh, the Ottoman world. And it's sort of seen here, this, this is a carpet which was supposed, to, the design I bet there, Beranger, was um, proposed for the, the, the Marie Antoinette's cabinet. She didn't accept it, and so um, it, it was in limbo, but then in the Napoleonic era, it was woven, and this is what we get, so we can get some idea what it would have looked like. And you see you've got crescents, you've got turbans, and you've got the smoking um, perfect bonus, which of course would have related to what was on the wall. On the left, you have, um, this is a door panel for the Comte d'Artois second cabinet Turk. He, he was very keen on cabinet Turks. He, he had uh, two in Versailles, he had another one at the top. Uh, and he was actually, uh, I mean, he, he was a, he was a advanced, um, in, in, in fashions for, for interior decoration, if you like. Um, but again, you can see it, it's basically French scrolls and flowers, but then you've got a ch sort of chubby little young Turk on the top, and then you've got a sort of slightly saucy, amorous uh, thing going on in the rondel, which is just as bad as, you know, which they could, because this, this sort of fantasy about the sort of the, the sexual things of, um, uh, of, of the 
uh, Ottoman world is one of the things which got some artists going and certainly uh, to the annoyance of, of Mary Wharton Montague. But anyway, so, uh, so the, 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 the room in fact, th these are just the doors, the room, room was actually covered in superb lampas, which is an extremely rich fabric of, of, of blue which was coordinated with the, with the sky and a colour which they call aurore, which I suspect is actually the, pretty much the colour that you see in the middle. So it would have been all very harmonious. The furnishings, everything was um, integrated very, very carefully. And, and the way they, they, they used French form furniture, but they draped it and swagged it and covered it in passement de to make it look more exotic. Um, now, these two, moving on, moving on to, are, it's, it's a pair, and it's actually representative of two ideas of, of, of love, if you like, in, um, in the Ottoman world. <coughs> on the left, you see, or is it, is it a sultan? He's holding a, a handkerchief. And he is, which is more like a threat, really, because it, 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 you, you, she is kneeling, and you get this impression she's imploring. No, in other words, it's a kind, it's a kind of re, uh, reworking in porcelain of the 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 the, um, the, 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 the drama or the between Osman and Emily in the Turk Genovur. And she, she rebutted his approaches because she loved somebody else and she is pleading and he is, for the, is holding back. Now, on the right, it's a role reversal. And it's, it's, it's rather amusing because one of uh, Mary Wally Montague's bet noirs was somebody called uh, Jean Dumont. And he wrote a most entertaining thing called A New Voyage to the Levant. And in it, he talks about a European man who found his way into the harem, was invited into the harem, and he experienced all the joys of love for two days, the end of which his strength being quite exhausted by Lord Morris' pleasure, sought to escape. And the, and the, the, the pasha's wife, who was entertained, made it extremely difficult, and it was only, he only managed to escape gratis a servant. But this, I think, you, so you've got kind of here, you've got the European man who is actually completely uh, dominated by the Sultana. So it does represent two views of the Ottoman world um, uh, in, in, in Europe at that time. Here, two more bits of porcelain where other attributes of the Ottoman world, smoking and, um, and, and drinking coffee. And it's, it's, a, the, the, it's, a, it's a start of the point, really, is something like the, this Nilsson engraving where you, you have incredible rakai scrolls, the pipe and everything. And then, but most notably picked up by Bustelli. But even on this hooked, um figure, you've got a little bit of, a little bit of scrolling. But the, the, coffee is really a, a Turkish attribute. Uh, which so um, you know, it, 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 I mean, even though we know it came from other places, it came to, to Europe via Turkey uh, you know, through the agencies of Armenians and others. But it, it, it was seen as, as the Turkish drink. Now, there's a huge amount of porcelain figures of uh, um, of, of, of the subject. Um, there's a lot less in our other materials. And um, it's interesting because the, the thing on the right, excuse me, the, le the left, the Augsburg piece, has a, has a dual function because in the, um, at the time that was made, basically it was, uh, the, 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 uh, Turkey, uh, the Ottoman was at its most powerful. And in fact, the Austro, uh, the Habsburg, uh, Habsburgs were having to pay tribute well, they, they called them presents, but the Ottomans saw them as tribute, and, and, and I think the Ottomans were right, because it was basically they had, to send, they had to send presents, they had to send money every year to Constantinople to keep things 
you know, keep peace. And one of the things that went down very well in um, uh, in, in, in Constantinople were, were automata. And this is one piece which it, it is like we know they receive them, that none of them seem to have survived there. But there's this, we, there's, in, there's instances where the emperor was obliged to give one of his automata to, for, for the tribute because they did, the, the, the makers hadn't done it in time. So what, basically what the, 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 the Habsburgs liked and wanted was also appreciated in the Ottoman world. So this one could have, I mean, it didn't go because it's, it's, it's part of the Habsburg treasury, but it, it's a sort of thing that could have gone to, the, uh, to, uh, to Istanbul as, as a tribute. Um, these figures on the left hand are, are all part of the sort of the, fa the fantasy. And they were, they're, they're about this high, and they are table centers. And I don't know if you know, but these, the porcelain figures that we've been looking at, they were originally intended to decorate the dessert table. That's why all those things were made. It wasn't really to put on shelves. It, it was, it was the, the, the table was dressed separately for the, for the dessert, and it was a huge production. Earlier they'd used sugar and whatever, but, and then you get a crossover where sugar and constructions and porcelain. So, this is kind of a, a, another application of the, but in silver gilt by Cousinet, who's an extremely important French silversmith in the mid 18th century. What is interesting is to see how his evocations of, of, of Turks are very similar to the bokeh um, designs that are going on pretty much the same time. Bokeh span quite a long period. These are mid um, mid century. And what's a bit amusing to think of it. These are things from a thing called the Act Turk, which is a, uh, another sort of opera piece by a man called Compa. And curiously, when Mehmed Said Effendi was traveling back with his father uh, to, to uh, Constantinople in 1721, they were in Lyon and they were asked what, uh, you know, what entertainment they would like. And he asked for Act Turk to be performed, which is extraordinary, really, when you think of a Turk asking for this complete, you know, fantasy of, European fantasy of, of what the Turks are about. Okay, nearly there. Um, this, where I think that we're, the, 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 I would argue that we're slightly transitional. Um, if, you, if you look at this interior, which was done, it's sort of completed by about eight, eight, 1807, um, it's quite different from, in spirit from the, uh, if you remember what the Marie Antoinette room is, it, which is about <coughs> the, um, 30 years earlier. This, this is one room, in fact, in a, in a palace, which actually, basically, it was in the Chinese style. It started off as a wooden construction. When uh, Ferdinand IV of Naples and, and Sicily bought it, when he had to flee from Naples and went to Palermo, they did a lot of rebuilding and it became a solid structure and most of it is in, Turkey, in, in, in Chinese style but on the top you have a the, 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 uh, Maria Carolina, his, his consort's um, Turkish room teeny little elements, the crescent dotted around but one of the things I find rather interesting is, is this detail here because it's very very similar to the east end facade of the cathedrals of Monreale and Palermo. And this interlocking arch is seen as a vestige of the Arab influence in Gothic architecture in, um, in, in, in that area, in, in, in Palermo. So it's rather fascinating that the decorator, we don't really know, there are a number of artists architects and painters involved. We don't know who was responsible for this. But the, 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 they have chosen something which is, um, uh, had, is seen as a crossover between uh, uh, the, the Arab world and the, and the um, Western world is, is, is I think, rather, rather interesting. The, the arch, the OG arch, you could point that, is, is, was seen as a, quite an Ottoman detail, you might remember that that, that detail was on the um, doorway of, of William Chambers's uh, mosque. 
And then this is another detail of the uh, Dufour panorama. And I think you can, the, the dialogue between these two is quite as an even, I mean, very convenient, even the palm trees but I mean, that sit outside. But it's, it's, but it, it, it's, it, it is a, it's just proof of how it's a view of this world at um, you know, several removes. Um, even further removed is, is Eugène de Bourgogne's uh, cabinet in, in uh, what is now the German embassy in, in Paris. Uh, I think it's interesting for a number of reasons. I mean, it, it's extremely lavish. I think we, for that we can thank Josephine and um, Hortense. But you've got the um, frieze up, stair, up top, which is based on uh, elements created from de Ferriol. So de, Fer uh, de Ferriol is surviving uh, over 100 years afterwards. And then you get dialogues. Th this was recently published uh, just before uh, the time of the um, well, room was built. You see the, the, the table there echoing the, the table uh, behind and then the footstools. Um, and the columns around the, 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 the room, not dissimilar to what, what you see there. So there's a dialogue. The other curious thing is actually on the fireplace, you get slightly Egyptian motifs. You can't see them in that reproduction. But of course, he had just been in Egypt with Napoleon. So there is this, again, mixing of identities. And I, I think just as a, uh, it's amusing to consider that in Istanbul at this time, you, what, what you get for Selim III, this is being done. And if you think, you know, you've got the lozenge inserts, you've got the, tr the trellis pattern. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting east-west dialogue. And I'll, I'll also, th this is a detail of the gravel engraving of, of the Solomon II, uh, where, I mean, again, you get the, e the European thing drifting into the uh, into, into Istanbul. And then this is really how, you know, this is the Tur Turkish room, but basically it's nothing, to, it's just a place to keep a vast array of <laughs> across the world Islamic armory. Uh, very, very splendid, but nothing to do with the past. And then finally, I think this is a, in a way an explain what, what is the difference between sort of Turkey and 19th century, I, you want to call it Orientalism, but, or even if, if you didn't call it Orientalism, the, the, the 19th century view. I think on the left, you've got, it's slightly joking, you've got the men looking in, we are watching the men looking in, so it's a kind of little funny game, it's quite amusing, it's, it's harmless. The, um, and we are actually, playing the role the game of those men. We, it's a much more much more of a voyeur game. And I, I should mention that um, well the interesting enough reiteration, that woman having her home care hair combed at the back is another quotation from De Ferriol. And this little figure is actually a quotation from that Turkish watercolour that you, you, we, we had next to, Marie, uh, to Madame de Pompadour. So, you know, again, a century and a half plus later, these sources are still being uh, dipped into. But even though that by, that, by this time, the interpretation is very different. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Hayden, for that tour de force in many different media, uh, bronze work, porcelain, painting, textiles, and so on. A really friendly east-west interaction. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Yes? I um, It's a little bit past your period, but I'm interested in about the Turkish rug on Freud's couch and what the antecedents for it are. And, you know, there are certain suggestions, but we only have one carpet in those, all those sort of slides, which slightly surprised me. And I think you have magic carpet, flying carpet. What, from your period, what do you think was going on in Floyd's mind when he put a magic, when he put a carpet in? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, well, the, the front, one of the things I should, it's, I find rather fascinating, 
about this, the, the, the Turkey of the is really it's about European um, fascination with Turkish ways of living. It's, it's a projection of ideas of love and blah, blah, blah. Um, at the same, that very time, we were not interested in Turkish objects. When we, when we were fearful of the Turks, we were mad for the Bursa textiles. We loved, we paid a fortune for the carpets. And so there's, the, 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 it's interesting that there's no, if you, you, you wouldn't see any element of, of the Turkish interior in really in those things I've shown you. And so, so I, I think the, car, the, the, the carpet thing, I, 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 I don't know, because if you think about that, in, in Romania, they, they, they use for church decoration. You know, because you, because they're nice and abstract, and the good old the Lutherans do not want a graven image. They they, they use it as, as a very neutral. I mean, it's not it's no it's no sort of I, I, it's not you know enabling you to fly away. On the, I mean, I, I don't know what was behind this night, but I, I don't I don't think. Um, anyway, there aren't any really antecedents for carpets being used for dreaming inducing states. No, don't, no. Well, look, I mean, you know, no. I mean, carpets. You know, they, they were used. They, they were not put on the floor. They were on tables. There's a, there's a very famous. Um, were, they put on, were they put on ottomans? Or were they no, no. They, they they were too precious. I mean, they, they I mean, if you think you, you, they, they, if you think there's there's a, there's a thing called the Somerset House Conference, which is a, a portrait, a painting, which is in the in the um, National Portrait Gallery, and it's a meeting of the English and the Spanish diplomats, and vroom, in the middle is a whole buying carpet on the table. And, that's, and they, they were so precious, you did not, you know, they, they, the Ottomans might have put them on the floor, but we, we, they were too precious for us. So we, we they, and, and they were, so that's, uh, so I think, I think they, they were status symbols. And that's why, you know, sometimes people, they, they tried to imitate them because they were, they were so valuable. I don't, I don't think there's, I don't think we picked up a sort of, like the, if you like, the magic carpet idea of... of sometimes you see Victorian times, Kind of opium dens with people lounging on carpets. <coughs> yes, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really haven't sort of analysed the, what sort of carpets they are, but quite often, you know, the, 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 there's not that exact representation, so you can't really tell. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's actually quite amusing. In, in there, there, you do get some little bit details of carpet in the in the in, in, in 18th century portraits, but they are. They're more, quite frankly, they're more neoclassical. They're not. They're not. They weren't really. In, they weren't really interested in them at that stage. If, if, if it, what were interested about uh, the Ottomans in the 18th century was a, a, a way of living. It wasn't the material of Ottoman culture. Where, where Another question. Uh, the Turkey, as a term, I think, is a fantastic uh, expression and a word actually because. I don't know if, uh, I think the date you're starting, 1699 or so, if I may, or, and then this yeah. 300 years that was sort of the, going through the art, how it uh, manifested itself, I will um, uh, quote uh, Mr. Mansfield's expression about the time in Europe of which actually the religious uh, uniformity was being enforced by um, empire rigid, rigid rules. And as a as a thing to escape this escapism, this fantasy against the um, religious uh, oppression, actually, of that time, and uh, to express that uh, fantasy in the sense that um, uh, maybe libertine rules or harem. Well, then, you know, yes, no, absolutely. I mean, it's very important. Connects to James's um, carpet, actually. Well, I, no, I see. I, 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 I mean, if you think, uh, if you think, if you think about Let Perzan, they are using, uh, yes. you know, he, he uses the um, guise of um, the the the, the, visit, the Persian visitors to criticise the French establishment. Voltaire uses it in in in, 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 in so they 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 find that world a marvellous. Veil behind, behind which they can offer criticism of their own society. Hundred days of uh, Solomon 
uh, you know, uh, Marquis de Sade's uh, thing might be referring to 2001 Nights in the sense that, you know, it comes, it just expresses a similar kind of uh, reaction to the religious oppression. I, I, and, the, um, uh, and maybe in the Turkey sense, it would be could call it Turkey, the harem. Uh, but I was, um, I was just going to say that actually I realized one of the major works which inspired me and became my first novel, which I took the name called Letters Writ by a Turkish Spy, which was basically published in 1684 by the uh in France, originally as uh, Espionage de Grand Seigneur. And um, this book then became 1691 English and added seven more volumes. Originally it was written by a Genovese called uh, Giovanni Marana. And he was basically cut involved in the, this conspiracy between Savoy and Genoa and was able to sort of find the character for himself, created the character which actually represented this amazing Descartian character, which was this tolerance, the epitome of tolerance, which was this Turk. Mm. His name is Mahmoud Arab. Mahmoud Arab. And uh, so, um, so he published this in France because he couldn't publish it in Italian, uh, thanks to the 14th and in uh, 1684. And then when it became English, somebody, which we don't know who that is, made it eight volumes of this whole ideas of Descartes in amazing tolerance with this character going around Europe and sending letters to uh, uh, Ottoman, uh, Serraglio which was 100 years before Montesquieu, actually, um, which basically, I think, is the major Turkery and the beginning of this whole uh, character, Turkish character. Yeah, I, I think, I think, it, look, I, I think, in a way, those things, <coughs> in a way, it's almost more, more serious, it's more, it's more, of a, you know, uh, a fight, I mean, but, uh, against establishment and, 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 in a way, voicing your criticism against the establishment. I'm afraid, I think, essence of Turkey is a lot more superficial. It's against the courts who are suffering from boredom and so the sort of slight sauciness of that the, 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 they could weave into the Turkey things and, and use an excuse. And, and dressing up, the, 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 there, are, there are lots of commentaries about um, uh, people, it was, seems slight for women to dress as a sultan, it was deemed slightly risky. You know, and, and so, but, but, but that game, but, but you, you have, because you were behind a mask, you, you, you or, or in a guise, you could get away with other things. And remember, Mary Wortley Montague was very much, you know, about, about property and things like that. She was full of praise about the, the Ottoman world. More, any more questions? Yes, over there. I know so little about this, but I had the impression that the Turkey, the, the movement, if I may call it that, was essentially one for the wealthy. Absolutely. And, and he didn't trickle down much in Maserati. Very little down no. Classes. No, not at all. That's that's a very interesting thing. It really was the Gratin that, that and, and that, that's interesting one of the reasons why when you see it, the quality is absolutely the best. It's the best goldsmiths. It's you know, you, you, I mean, you can see it. The Meissen did fantastic. They're, 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 it really is the best. And, and you know, the, the number of people that were the, the top Ebenezer uh, and 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 and, and, and uh, Menuzia were, were doing things in France. France yeah, is actually the main yeah. stay of this whole thing. And and like in England, if, if if it's anything, it's well, you've got the mosque. A queue, but it's fancy dress. We really got into that, and it, 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 all throughout the century. And you get a lot of portraits in fancy dress. Question, Camille? I, I guess that's just um, that's not including coffee because coffee did go down. Yeah, coffee. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, coffee. Yes, that's true. And and and, and also the and interesting thing, the, the the coffee house as a place where as a place for discussion and debate, which um, it, in, if you think when coffee first arrived in. In, in, in Mecca and places like that, there was a big, you know, they, they, they had a big debate as to whether it could be, whether it was it, um, uh, whether it could be allowed or not, because it was one of the gave, one of the things that enabled men to leave their house and gather together and discuss, and that was politically risky. But they, they decided, as it wasn't it wasn't an intoxicant, they could let they would let it be. So it, this very thing of coffee houses in, in the uh, Muslim world being a place where you could go and discuss 
in a way, is comes through and the way you get the coffee houses in in uh, in London and and well, the first one in Oxford. In, in the, they, they, it was a place for, to meet and discuss. So, coffee in that respect, it is. But the, the coffee, I agree. But the arts, the the, the theatre, all that thing, is really for the high. Except, I mean, something like the Théâtre de la Foire, Saint Germain, uh, the Saint Germain, and the Saint Laurent Fairs. Um, those could have been seen by a wider audience, but that that's about the limit. The, the other, the other, I think in, 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 in France in the 18th century, poorer people could get to see some theatre. They wouldn't be necessarily terribly good seats, but they, they, they were slightly accessible, and they would have probably they would have enjoyed they would have particularly enjoyed all the sort of kind of patriotic sort of you know bravo the french um sultana one sort of thing well on that note i think <laughs> it's time for supper for some of us thank you so much hayden and i'm sure there's ample material for another book on <laughs> another lecture on geography and thank you very much indeed I'm sure.